Let's start this with a puzzle. Let's say you're a mathematician in World War II and you've been hired to help figure out where to put armor over various fighter planes that have come back from combat. Many planes went into the war zone, some never came back, and some came back with a lot of bullet holes, but they survived luckily. So officers wanted to put armor over the planes to help shield them from bullets, but they cannot put too much armor on or the weight will be too high. They can only put armor over certain regions. As a mathematician, you analyze all the big parts of the plane, including the engine, fuselage, fuel system, and other less important parts, and you measure the bullet holes per square foot so you can see which part is taking the highest density of shots. You find the engine only has 0.2 bullet holes per square foot, the fuselage has 1.8, the fuel system has 1.6, and the other parts of the plane have 1.9. The engine is very low, but looking at these high numbers, should you maybe shield the other parts of the plane, or is that too much area and maybe focus on the fuselage because of the still high density, maybe split it up 50-50? Well, during World War II, officers came to a mathematician named Abraham Wald with this exact question. His answer was not what they expected though. He said to put armor over the engine. He said to put armor over the place where the bullet holes aren't. Because where are those bullets? They're on the planes that never came back. There were such few bullet holes on the engine because most of the time the engine that was shot caused the plane to go down. By using this logic and analysis, the mathematician was able to analyze the missing planes and why they crashed by only analyzing the ones that did not crash. This is one of the first stories from the book How Not To Be Wrong, The Power Of Mathematical Thinking, which will be what this video is about. This example may not apply to something you will be asked to do in your lifetime, but the reality is we use math all the time in terms of logic and interpreting numbers and more. If you didn't get this first example, don't worry, there's more to come, so let's get started. Now if you've ever looked at your math homework and asked, when will I ever use this? It's a fair question. The quadratic formula, synthetic division, indefinite integrals, and so on. When does this come up in real life? And honestly, the answer is really never, sorry to say. Some exceptions to this would be people going into math, various sciences, and engineering to name a few. At the very least, you'll see more intensive math in college. But what you learn in high school is not exactly what math is. They don't do a great job. Math can be much more profound, and the author actually makes four categories of math. There's profound and shallow versus simple and complicated. Adding two numbers or memorizing some basic formula is simple and shallow. No real depth here. Doing certain indefinite integrals or creating an equation for a complicated function is shallow and complicated. This does put a strain on your brain if you've done it, but it's mostly repeating steps and just following procedures. Profound and complicated math includes things that most people in high school and even college will never have heard of, like the Riemann hypothesis, the Poincaré conjecture, and more abstract concepts. This is what pure mathematicians learn, by the way. If you major in pure math in college, this is some of the stuff you can expect, and it's heavily proof-based rather than just following steps. Then there's profound and simple math, which is the subject of this video, and we use it all the time, like using logic to analyze everyday numbers and situations, kind of like the example with the World War II planes. Even though it's not something you need to do specifically, you didn't need any algebra knowledge for it, but you did need to use logic, reasoning, interpretation, etc., which makes it more profound math. With profound math, you're asking things like, what are we assuming, and are those assumptions valid? which is what pure mathematicians do in a more rigorous way, but we ask that too about decisions and situations all the time. Moving on, one simple thing people do a lot is linear thinking. Really, anyone could agree that not all curves are straight lines, although people think the opposite a lot. Like, let's say country X is about to raise taxes, and people say that's a bad idea, and the reasoning is because some other country, country Y, has been raising taxes and their economy is getting worse. Now, they could be right, we don't know enough facts, but thinking that simply is linear thinking. It's assuming if you were to graph the tax percentage from 0 to 100 versus the strength of the economy, it would be a straight line. And the more you tax, the worse it gets. When in reality, there's some curve to it. It probably wouldn't be centered like this, but there would be some peak. Country Y might be here, where yes, increasing is a mistake, but if country X is located here, then it might be a good decision. Now, of course, this was way oversimplified, but that's the idea. Now let's move on to another puzzle. What states do you think have the highest percentage of people with brain cancer? Okay, this isn't the real puzzle quite yet, but of all the states, California might have the most amount of people with brain cancer because it's very populated. But if we look at proportions of people with brain cancer versus the state's population, we can come to a better conclusion. I'll just tell you the answer, and it's these states have the highest percentage of people with brain cancer, much higher than average, and at the bottom of the list, these states have the lowest. So it looks like maybe we should avoid these states. But the real question is, why is it like this? Is there something in the water in these states, or are there other factors at play? 
Keep this in mind for this next part where we're going to play a game. The game is you're going to play against someone else for who can flip a coin and get heads the most. But one of you will flip the coin 10 times and the other will flip it 100 times. Now it would not be fair to count the sheer amount of heads or the person on the right would win like every time. So we'll do percentages. If this person flips 5 heads and this person flips 48, that's 50% versus 48%, so the person on the left wins. But we won't play just once because of course this is luck. So we're going to play the game 10 times. They will each flip the respective amount for 10 trials. Then we'll take the top percentage of all 10 trials for each person and whoever has the highest wins. In the first 10 flips, this person might get 5 heads, then they do it again and get 4, then 7, then 4, then 6, and so on. And this other person might get 57, 45, 51, 66, and so on. You take the highest percentage of all 10 and that's the winner. Now would you be willing to play this game like if it were for money? What if you could decide who you got to be? Would that help you or be of interest? Believe it or not, this game is not a fair one. This person would win pretty much every time. But why is that? When the person on the left flips a coin 10 times for 10 different trials, the results of the amount of heads might look like this. There's a chance they might have an 8 or 9 in there somewhere, and that would be their highest score, in this case 80%. But with the other person, if they flip the coin 100 times for 10 trials, their results of the amount of heads out of 100 might look like this. The numbers are much closer to 50. The highest percentage here is 59% and they'd lose. You could expect this every time pretty much. In fact, you'd probably have to play this game like a billion times before you got to 80 or more heads out of 100. So why does this happen? It's because as you flip the coin more and more, the outcome tends to go toward the expected value of 50-50. If you were to record the amount of flips versus the percentage of heads, you'd see something very interesting. After one flip, let's say you get heads, so you've gotten heads 100% of the time. Then the second flip maybe comes up tails, so now 50% of your flips have been heads. Then if the next is tails, only 33% of your flips have been heads. If you connect these points and keep flipping, as you keep going, the curve approaches 50% more and more, as if being pulled in by something. This is known as the law of large numbers. Large number of trials tend toward the expected value, while a small number of trials are much more affected by luck of the draw and randomness. If you were to flip a coin a million times, you'd need an insane amount of trials before you'd land even 60% heads. Now if we go back to our states with high and low brain cancer concentrations, do you notice every state you see here is low in population? Just like the person who flips a coin 10 times might get 3 heads or 9 out of the 10 if we experiment enough, if we look at enough states with low populations, they will be subject to much more extreme outcomes whether it be high or low. Same thing if you look at the stats for free throws in basketball. You might see the highest percentage of shots made has been done by some rookie who has barely ever played. But analyzing it, we see he's only shot a few free throws and got lucky with those ones maybe. That's why people often aren't counted until they play enough. So what can we learn from this? Well, it's very easy to read or hear something that is true, like a higher percentage of people have brain cancer in South Dakota than in any other state. But without a reason for why, we can easily come up with our own very wrong conclusions, like there must be some epidemic going on in that state. So when you're presented with information, be open to the idea that there is something else beneath the surface that could easily disprove any assumptions that you've made. Now on to the next topic, I'm going to make the claim that one lottery ticket is better than two, at least if you're buying them. This seems odd, because wouldn't two tickets mean your odds are twice as high of making millions of dollars? And that is true, but there's more to it. Let's oversimplify the lottery and say if you win, you get $8 million. Each ticket is $1, and how it works is each ticket has a combination of numbers on it, and there are 10 million total ways to rearrange the numbers that will be selected. So if you buy one ticket, you spend $1, and you have a 1 in 10 million chance of winning $8 million. If you buy two tickets, you spend $2, and you have a 2 in 10 million chance of winning that same amount. That seems better, right? Well, let's take it to an extreme. What if you bought every ticket? You buy 10 million tickets and are now guaranteed to win. This means you spend $10 million and you have a 100% chance of winning $8 million. Now, do you like that deal of losing $2 million no matter what? Not so good. Well, as you keep going up from one ticket to two and so on, it's more obvious that the deal is worse and worse. You can try it again with 8 million tickets and you have an 80% chance of breaking even, best case scenario. The deals are terrible and that's just how it is. The best deal when it comes to playing the lottery is buying zero tickets. The next best deal is buying one. What would a ticket be worth to you though? 
You can easily just take your odds of winning based on one ticket and multiply that by how much you would win, plus your chance of losing times how much you'd win in that case, add them up and you get 80 cents. If the ticket were 80 cents or less, you could say it's worth it. If you bought 10 million tickets at 80 cents, that's $8 million you spend and you'd have a 100% chance of winning $8 million, so you're guaranteed to break even. I guess not worth it, but you don't lose. But if it were 79 cents or less, the odds are in your favor, and the more tickets you buy, the higher your odds are you'd win something. Hopefully this combined with the law of large numbers really reveals why the house always wins. When you gamble or play the lottery and give your money to someone, remember they've done the math in advance. Okay, so this has been a lot of hard numbers, but what about when we look at human behavior and why we make decisions? A famous economist used to say, if you never miss a plane, you're spending too much time in airports. This seems weird, but wait till you see the math. This means that if you take a lot of flights and you've made every single one, assuming you value your time, you're spending too much time waiting in the airport. So let's go into the math. If you get to the airport one hour early, let's say you have a 15% chance of missing your flight. If you arrive 1.5 hours early, you have a 5% chance. And if you arrive two hours early, you have a 2% chance of missing your flight. Now these might not be totally true, but of course there are some values we could assign to these based on data, and these seem reasonable. Next, we are actually going to measure happiness with a unit called utils. That's just what we'll call it, which is actually a unit of happiness they use in microeconomics. Util is short for utility. So maybe getting a good test score gives you plus 50 utils of happiness, and waiting in a long line is a loss of 20 utils because you're not happy with that situation. This is super arbitrary, but we can come up with some numbers relative to others. So how many utils is waiting for an airplane to depart? Well, let's just say it's minus 20 utils per hour. The more you wait, the less happy you get. Now, how much sadness would missing your flight cause? Let's say it's minus 300 utils or 15 times worse than waiting an hour. How I came up with these, by the way, is hypothetically, I might pay 20 an hour to avoid waiting for a plane and just board, and I'd have to be paid $300 to be okay with missing my flight, so long as it's not extremely crucial and I get my money back. That's what they're worth to me in terms of the events. So we can calculate the expected loss and happiness for everything. If we arrive one hour early, we lose 20 utils for that one hour of time before we board the plane, minus a 15% chance of losing 300 utils, which is a net outcome of losing 65. As in, if we arrived an hour early for 100 flights, let's say, this would be the average loss in happiness. Next, if we arrive 1.5 hours early, we do negative 20 utils times 1.5 hours of waiting instead of just one. Then with only a 5% chance of missing our flight, we multiply by 300 and we get minus 45 utils. And the next one we do the same thing and we get an output of minus 46. So look at that. This is the worst. Doing this over and over you'd expect to be the least happy because of the magnitude of the loss. But this is actually the best. If you keep doing this, you can expect the maximum happiness even if it involves missing one flight out of 20. Coming two hours early is too early in terms of optimizing happiness. Now you probably have some objections to this because of how things were valued maybe, and you're totally right, this will be way different for everyone in every situation. But would you agree that it's not ideal if you arrive 10 minutes before your flight and miss it 90% of the time? And also on the other side of the spectrum, you would not want to arrive 14 hours before your flight and be guaranteed to make it because that's way too long. If you can agree with this, then you can at least say there's some number in between these that will optimize your happiness based on however you weigh the worth of waiting around versus missing a flight. This is also probably why if you play the lottery, then the numbers I discussed earlier may not change your mind. Because winning $8 million might be worth 8 million utils to you of happiness. But $1 for a ticket doesn't correspond to one util, because losing $1 is like maybe losing a penny to you or .01 utils. All just pocket change. So you can say it's minus .01 utils to buy the ticket, plus 8 million if you win, and if you multiply by the probability of winning that 8 million, the outcome still comes out positive. The expected value says to just do it because it will cause happiness if you keep playing. But things might change if we played a different game. What if we flip a coin and if it's heads you get $200,000 and if it's tails you lose $100,000? Well let's just do the math. If you played that 10 times the expected value is you get 5 heads and 5 tails. So 5 heads times 200,000 for each win minus 5 tails times 100,000 for each loss and you come out with $500,000 at the end and over 10 flips that means you'll average $50,000 every time you play. The odds are in your favor. But be honest. If you were really given this opportunity right now, would you play it? And if you don't have 100k to lose, it means you'd go in that much debt. 
You probably would not play this game then, and that's because you might view $200,000 as 200,000 utils, but losing 100,000 is like minus 1 million utils. The years and years of payments and stress of that is probably much more of a burden. So sometimes our emotions and view of the world cloud our vision of what the numbers are telling us, but that's because we aren't robots and sometimes it is the logical thing to do. Now these were just some examples from this book, but there are so many more. This does not do justice for what you'll learn. And I'll do one more which is more fun. We're going to look at the phrase, attractive men and women are often not very nice. Now I'm not going to debate whether this is true or not, but rather show a flaw in where this assumption often comes from. So maybe you haven't been on a lot of dates, but maybe you have, and because of that and what you've experienced, you say this saying is definitely valid. If you made a graph of your partners with unattractive to very attractive versus mean to nice, you might have a lot of data points if you've gone on plenty of dates, and then you can make a trend line which might look like this. From this we can see that yes, as the person gets more attractive, the trend line goes down in terms of how nice they are. But this issue can be found with just one question. How many unattractive, mean people have you dated? Yeah, it's probably none. An unattractive, mean person would not even be on your radar. In fact, if we lined up all the people you dated who were mean, we know that all of them, or at least most, would be attractive to some degree. Because unattractive, mean people, again, are not on your radar. So you might be able to admit that, okay, there are good-looking, nice people, but all the mean people I've dated were good-looking. And to that, we can now say that, of course that's true. How could it not be? Now, this information doesn't mean this assumption is totally wrong, it just means we aren't looking at the full picture. I know everyone will have different thoughts on this, but hopefully you can at least take away that when you gather data you may think is random, sometimes it's not so random. Like the people you date you may not know well, but you chose them maybe because of attractiveness, their personality, or a mix. Anyone else was filtered out, meaning your data isn't so random after all. And I'm just about done, but if you came to this video expecting to learn how calculus applies to various physics applications and whether imaginary numbers have any applications in the real world, then sorry it was not here, but I do have some videos on this channel you may find interesting that I'll link below. But these were some examples of how math can come up in your life, but not so much in the way that school taught you. Honestly, you may not use any of this information anytime soon. You may still get to the airport early, you might keep playing the lottery, you might not question any assumptions you've made in your life, and so on. But this type of thinking and reasoning can open you up to making wiser decisions and not be so quick to come to conclusions. Maybe when presented with data or new information, you'll take a second to analyze any missing pieces you may not have. Maybe you'll think twice about waiting an hour in line to save $2. Or maybe it'll help show you that taking some examples to certain extremes can reveal any absurdities, such as buying every possible lottery ticket and realizing it's more of a fun activity than a wise investment. You may be thinking math you do in high school doesn't teach you any of this, but it kind of can. It can train you on logical thinking and reasoning. Well, yes, we could agree school is too much of teaching you to be a calculator and just repeat steps, but just like a soccer player might do ladder drills during practice, they're never going to physically do that in a game, but it trains them on agility that's needed within a game. And the math you learn is very similar. We know it doesn't do a perfect job, but hopefully this opened up your mind in terms of what math is and how to view certain situations. Again, this video does not do justice for how much the book covers, and the link to it is in the description if you want to buy the book and support the channel. Otherwise, if you like the video, don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe, and I'll see you all next time.